And speaking of India's influence, our next story is about Chandrayaan-3. You probably remember how India scripted history last week. It became the first country to land a craft near the lunar South Pole and the fourth nation to land on the moon. Now, India has given the world an even bigger reason to moon over its lunar mission. In a first, India's moon rover Pragyan has confirmed the presence of sulphur on the lunar south pole. It has also detected the presence of other elements like aluminium, calcium, iron and oxygen. Why is this discovery a big deal? And what is next on the rover's mind? Our next report tells you. Have you ever seen this element before? Maybe you haven't, but we can bet that you've used it. This is sulphur or as many Indonesians like to call it, devil's gold. Yes, they've nicknamed this element, partly due to its yellow colour, but also because it's a valuable commodity. Because an Indonesian volcano named Kawa Ijen holds sulphur in large quantities. As the sulphur deposits catch light, they make the volcano come alive with blue fire. This invites a throng of tourists and employment for locals, who use it to make a wide range of goods like car batteries, fertilizer, bleach and cement detergents. Sulphur is also used in oil refining, water processing and mineral extraction. Sulphur usually originates in volcanic activities. And do you know what else has volcanoes? The moon. It had a lot of active volcanoes in the past. In fact, many parts of the moon's surface are covered with hardened lava. So, since the 1970s, the world knew that the moon holds sulphur this yellow element we told you about. But we weren't sure if it was present in the lunar south. We knew about it in theory, but there was no direct evidence. No one knew, because no one had been there. It wasn't feasible to confirm this by orbiters studying the moon. Orbiters are spacecrafts that do just that. They orbit, but they don't land on the moon. But guess who just did? India's Chandrayaan-3. It was historic. India became the first nation to land on the lunar south on the 23rd of August. By being there, the Indian rover Pragyan was able to hold scientific experiments, something that's never happened before. It was able to measure elemental composition. And now, the rover has struck gold. Devil's gold, to be precise. In a first, it has confirmed the presence of sulphur on the lunar south and also detected the presence of other elements like aluminum, calcium, iron, chromium, titanium, manganese, silicon and oxygen. Why is the confirmation of sulphur such a big deal? Because of the stories it will tell. It can reveal insights about the moon. It can tell the world a lot about the moon's formation, as well as its history and evolution. So finding sulphur is a tremendous accomplishment. Chandrayaan-3 has already achieved one of its major objectives. After all, since it landed, the rover has been hard at work. It wanted to study the composition of elements on the lunar south, and it has. But the rover isn't done yet. Since it landed, it's been moonlighting as a hydrogen hunter. Pragyan wants to investigate the presence of hydrogen on the south pole of the moon. It's looking for signs of frozen water. If found, it will be a game changer, one of the greatest discoveries in space. Why is that? Simply put, if you want to send astronauts to the moon, a place with water would be a good spot. It could also open doors to life on the moon. Humans need water to survive. Water can be used to procure oxygen, which will provide air to breathe. Water can also be used to make rocket fuel. It will help people come back to Earth or go somewhere else in the solar system. The opportunities are endless. There's no way to water down its importance. As of right now, no one knows if the rover will be successful in finding frozen water. But on Earth, we continue to look at the bigger picture. And the fact is, whatever Pragyan does up there will be historic down here. Maybe this attitude explains our next story. It's about an opinion poll conducted across 24 countries, most of them from the G20. Now, every opinion poll has a question or a set of questions. This one was linked to India. How do you view India's position in the world? Has New Delhi's influence increased recently? Things like that. That's what the survey was about. And the answers reveal some interesting trends. Most Indians are upbeat about the trajectory. They think we're on the right track. 
Let me show you the numbers. Around 68% of Indian respondents say the country is becoming more influential. 19% say it's about the same. Only 13% say India is becoming weaker. And what about the leadership? Around 79% Indians have a favorable view of the Prime Minister. Around 55% have very favorable views. They believe Prime Minister Modi is taking the right calls at the world stage. These numbers are very important, especially coming at this time. India is all set to host the G20 Leaders' Summit. There is more global interest in India's policy and positions. In that context, public opinion is important. Do the Indian people support and approve of the current direction? Going by this survey, they do. And what about people outside India? What do they have to say? By and large, India is seen favorably. Around 46% of respondents held this view. They saw India positively, 46%. Around 34% held unfavorable views of India, and the rest were undecided. Now, it's hard to judge public perceptions of a country, especially a country like India. We are not part of any treaty alliance. We don't have a history of intervening abroad. So public perception can be tricky. This survey, for example, studied 30,000 people. It's a reasonable size for an opinion poll. But remember, the G20 is much bigger. Its total population is almost 4.7 billion people. Even within that, some countries were not polled, like Russia, China, and Turkey. Their responses could have affected these numbers in a good way or bad. Well, that's up for debate. A second question in the survey was about India's influence. Has India become more influential or not? Like I said, around 68% of Indians said yes. And elsewhere, only 28%. So an overwhelming number of Indians believe their country is now more influential on the world stage. But people outside India don't agree. Now to the third important question. What do you think of the Prime Minister? This was part of the survey. Again, there is a split. 79% of Indian respondents supported him. And outside India, around 37% supported him. Now, these are the three more major questions, rather, from the poll. If you dig deeper, some trends emerge. Like, where is India losing popularity? Europe is one place. Ten countries from the continent were part of the survey. Three of them had more negative views of India than positive. One was split equally. At first look, this is not really a problem. Just three out of ten countries. That could easily be a sampling error. But the devil is in the detail. In 2007, 29% of French people held, held an unfavorable view of India, 29%. In 2023, it has increased to 39%. Then we have Spain. In 2007, 34% of Spaniards held negative views of India, and now around 49%. In Germany, it has increased from 29 to 38%. In the UK, from 9, 9 to 30%. In Poland, from 24 to 34%. What explains this slide for India? One reason could be the war in Ukraine. India has not condemned or criticized Russia's invasion. Most leaders in the West have accepted this. But their people, maybe not as much. Imagine you're an average citizen living in Europe. After the war, your energy bills are higher. Your inflation is higher. Your government is spending more on defense than social welfare. Naturally, you would be unhappy. And perhaps some of that anger is rubbing off on India. But the problem is not just in Europe. It's also in Latin America. Mexico is the only G20 member country with a favorable view of India. In Brazil, 43% hold negative views. In Argentina, 34%. And honestly, it's a bit surprising. Brazil and India are part of the BRICS group. Argentina is joining next year. So public perception in these countries is important for New Delhi. Same with South Africa. Another BRICS member. 51% respondents in South Africa shared negative views on India. And this is really surprising. We have historical ties with South Africa. This is a country that shares so many values with India. Yet the public opinion is not good. Like I said, these numbers may not be 100% accurate, but there are lessons to be learned here. Engagement and investment is important. If you invest in a relationship, it will give you dividends. Case in point, Israel. It is the country with the highest favorable outlook on India, around 71%. 71% Israelis hold a positive view of India. It's a relationship India has worked on. In 2017, Prime Minister Modi became the first Indian PM to visit the country, the first in seven decades. We are also part of the IT, I2U2 grouping, India, Israel, the United States, and the UAE. 
All of this has built public support for India. Compare this to Latin America. The Prime Minister has visited three countries in the last 10 years there. Only one was a standalone trip. The visit to Brazil was for BRICS. The visit to Argentina was for the G20. India's diplomatic presence in the region is also limited. Just 11 missions had been opened from 1947 to 2019. That's simply not enough. You need to be visible for people to like or dislike you. And that's probably the biggest takeaway from this poll because around 16% of respondents the world over had no opinion on India, neither positive nor negative. And this needs to change. A positive public perception can help build better ties. In the US, for example, the positive view on India is 51%. Hence, there is bipartisan support for India. So don't think people don't matter in foreign policy. Would you play a game on Netflix? Actually, let me rephrase that. Did you know that Netflix actually had games? From 2021, multiple games have been available on the platform. Now, when I say games, temper your expectations. It's not like Call of Duty or Fortnite. These are more basic games. You could only play them on Netflix's mobile application. But that is about to change. The company is planning a major expansion into the world of gaming. And the reason is quite simple, to attract and retain more audience, to keep making money, because right now the business is a bit shaky. You see, not everyone wants to watch a movie or a TV show. Some people like to be more involved, and that's where games come in. And I know gaming consoles have existed for a long time, like the PlayStation or the Xbox, but these tend to be expensive. Netflix, on the other hand, is a subscription. It's like a two-in-one deal. You get TV shows and also games. This month, the company rolled out their first public tests. A few subscribers in the US and Canada got access to Netflix games on TV. These are cloud streaming games. And what does that mean? It means you don't have to download the game. The files will remain in some data center far away. You can stream the game online, like you do with any content on OTT. You don't have to download it to consume it. Other big players have tried cloud gaming before. Google had something called Stadia. It was so bad, they ended up canceling it. Amazon had something called Luna. Again, not a big success. So what makes Netflix think that they can succeed where Google and Amazon failed? Two things. One, Netflix has some good exclusive properties. I'm talking about shows. Cult favorites like Stranger Things or Queen's Gambit. Imagine creating a game based on these shows or linking the game to storylines on the show. Would you play it then? Maybe the diehard fans will. In fact, Netflix is already making a show based on the Queen's Gambit. It's a chess simulator game. The second factor is necessity because Netflix does not have an option. Look at their recent performance. The platform added around 6 million subscribers in the last quarter. Very impressive. But the profits are not matching up. Netflix posted $1.5 billion in profits, which is just 2.7% more than the year before. For an industry leader, that's not enough. And it's not just Netflix. Disney, for example, is even worse. The company is being sued for misleading investors on losses. They reported around $3.7 billion in losses last year. And if that was misleading, $3.7 billion, you can imagine the real damage. The fact is, streaming has its own problems. Its rise during the pandemic was unprecedented, but sustaining that has been tough. Which is why most OTT giants have increased prices. Netflix, Peacock, Hulu, HBO, all of them have made ad-free subscriptions more expensive. But there is a downside to this strategy. You could drive people away from the platform. So streaming giants need to diversify. They can't keep running shows into double-digit seasons. You need something more. Enter games. Netflix already offers around 70 of them on mobile apps. 70 games, 7-0. But like I said, these are basic ones. They won't attract the hardcore gamers. But maybe that's the plan. The likes of Google and Amazon invested millions in cloud gaming. Their bet was huge, so was their fall. In contrast, Netflix is starting on a smaller budget, smaller games, and smaller marketing push. Whether it works or not could define the next chapter of streaming. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Madrid, thousands call for the resignation of Spanish football chief Luis Rubiales. Rubiales kissed Spanish national star Jenny Hermoso without her consent 
at the Women's World Cup final. Meanwhile, Spain is painting the town of uh, Bunol red. The city marked the annual Tomatina Festival, where revelers threw tomatoes at each other. And the month of August began with a bright supermoon. It is ending the same way as another one lights up the night sky tonight. This is the last super blue moon until 2037. So catch it while you can. And finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1967, the U.S. Senate confirmed the appointment of Thurgood Marshall to the U.S. Supreme Court. He became the first African-American justice in the top court. We're leaving you with that. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.